our title today is What's the Deal with Water Baptism? And you know, I can stand here before you. I was raised in a Baptist church. Southern, I was Southern Baptist from a child. And I was always taught that water baptism had nothing whatsoever to do with your salvation. But you followed Christ in believer's baptism. That's what we were taught. And uh, when you get down to the point of trying to take water baptism away, you get some lathered up people. I mean, boy, they're almost ready to fight you over water baptism. I remember Brother Gary Jordan, uh, he's a deacon down at our assembly. He actually is the one that gave me the tape nine years ago that I heard Brother Jordan and began to understand right division. He and I were at the hospital one day, and there was a Baptist preacher friend that I had, I thought I had anyway, but we began to talk to him. And, uh, and I told him, I said, well, I'll tell you why I'm not a Baptist anymore. And he jerked them shoulders back. I know why I'm a Baptist. And he began to talk, and Brother Gary Jordan looked at him. He said, well, you know that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. And he kind of looked at him at like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> and Gary said, well, you know, Christ died at the end of all of those books, and you can't have a New Testament till the death of... And boy, then he jerked them shoulders back again. He said, I'm not a novice. And boy, he was ready to fight then. I mean, he was really upset. I followed him all the way to his car about five foot behind him talking to him. I talked to him for down two flights of stairs, <laughs> all the way out to his car. I was standing at his car, and I was telling him, look, I, I just want to talk to you about the Scriptures. Can you do that? And he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to this deal with water baptism, they're kind of like what James calls, I think Charlie might have mentioned it, double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're double-minded in that, oh, you don't have to have salvation, but don't you dare take it away from me. Got to have it. They have it as an ordinance, communion and water baptism. And it took me a little while to get a hold of it, but I'm going to tell you something. You cannot refute the verses. If you're here and you're beginning to see truth, if you're from a denominational assembly, don't leave the verses. Leave everything else, but don't leave the verses. Amen. Stick with God's Word in the King James Bible to English-speaking people. Stay with it. Don't give it up. And one more thing let me mention to you that our assembly does support Great School of the Bible. And if your assembly doesn't have a mission to support, that's a great mission. It's a great outreach. So I encourage you in your assembly, if you don't, give some support to Great School of the Bible. You ought to. I wouldn't be here in this position Today in this place, if it hadn't have been for Grace School of the Bible, I don't believe. And uh, I thank God for the commitment that Brother Jordan's had to the ministry and because of the fruit from it. And I'm sure uh, he, 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 he's, I know he don't like being pushed up or anything. I'm not putting him up. I'm putting up just thank God for his commitment to the Word of God. And you too can do the same thing. Commit to God's Word and stand and be who God's made you in Christ. So, and as you think about this thing of baptism, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things, but, and I tried my best to get a meeting with a um, Church of Christ preacher. I was trying to meet with him. I know some people that go to his assembly, and he's, a, he's, a, he's a, just a great man as far as human being goes, as far as helping people. I mean, this man would give you the shirt off his back. He's kind, but he's... He's in that doctrine, and I really wanted to talk to him. I wanted to get his straight ideas right straight from him, why he does what he does, and I've not been able to sit down with him yet, but I'm still going to do that when I get back um, and uh, try to talk with him and get some of his ideas on. I was really hoping to get that so I could use it up here. Uh, but anyway, the thing of water baptism with the Baptist, they, they always taught me growing up it had nothing to do with salvation, but boy, you need to get it. Brother Marvin was telling me that he got kicked out because he didn't get water baptized. Uh, so uh, I won't go into all that because I got 43 minutes now. So I got to do a lot of preaching fast. So you got to do a lot of listening. All right. Uh, let's just remember real quickly without turning to any of these verses. You do understand the uh, plan that Satan had against God to usurp heaven and earth. If you look at Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and Genesis 14, you can find all about 
Lucifer trafficking in his plan of evil and how that uh, even in the book of Isaiah, there's five I wills he says he's going to do. And one of them was, the last one was to be like the Most High God. Genesis 14 tells you clearly that the Most High God is possessor of heaven and earth. And if you understand those things, you get that understood. You go to the book of Ephesians chapter number 1, and you'll find out that we were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. Then you go to the book of Matthew chapter 25 verse 34, the judgment of the nations. He tells Israel, those on the right hand, to enter in to the joys of the Lord prepared from the foundation of the world. When you understand the two spheres and you understand heaven and earth, in the beginning, in the very first verse, God created heaven and earth. You have this thing all the way through the Bible. If you understand those things, you can understand how and what God's doing. God gave every creature volition. Even the angelic host had volition. They had the right to do and to worship God for who God had made them. And he gave them that privilege. And he knew Satan would turn on him. He knew that Lucifer would turn on him and become a Satan and adversary. That's why before the foundation of the world, he knew about you and I going to the heavenly places. But he also kept that secret from Satan, from Lucifer. And I, I like, I've never forgot hearing Brother Jordan say the most shocked creature in all the universe when the mystery was revealed to Paul was Satan. Never forgot that. And I think about it often. And as you think about that, you think about heaven, you think about earth, you understand the two programs that God has, then that will help you understand baptism. Then let's come to the point of, I skipped my first point, I just told you about it without looking at any of the verses. So look at the second point I want to talk to you about today is taking a look at the nation of Israel who God has to reconcile the earth with the nation of Israel. God has a plan for Israel. Look at Exodus, well, first, well just 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can hold that. We'll go back there later. That's the key verse that I had to start with. That's my text verse. But go to the book of Exodus chapter number 19. Exodus chapter number 19. And verse number 3. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. The Bible says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, and for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. You understand that out of all the people, and you think about Adam and how he failed God. Then you think about how it comes up to Noah. I mean, he gets a good fresh start, a picture of the kingdom. He comes off the ark, and they fail God. And then God chooses an old hungry Syrian and from him comes Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 patriarchs. And you have the nation of Israel coming along. And God has a plan for planet earth that the nation of Israel and those 12 tribes, they will be his government in the earth. They're going to be a kingdom of priests to him according to this verse. Look at verse 6 again. And ye shall, the nation, ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, if you will, look with me in the book of Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. Verse number 1. He says, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. He's preparing Aaron and his sons as ministers. Uh, verse number 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. In order to have a priest ready to minister, 
in the priest's office, they have to be washed with water. Not only that, verse 7, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. When you think about this thing of water baptism, you think about all the things that go with it. I was probably baptized four times growing up. I remember one time I had a cast on my leg, you know, and they got out and everybody was around, around the pond there and had to get tars and this thing. Shall we gather at the river, you know? And I'm thinking, this is a pond. <laughs> but, you know, they get in. Baptized. I had that cast on my leg and I was hobbling around there and I told my mom, I said, I don't get baptized. She said, you've got a cast on your leg. I always wanted to get involved with it when they had it done. And uh, never could get in, but I did get the cast all messed up and I had to go to the doctor and get another cast put on. God kept easing out in there trying to get in that water. Well, water baptism was something we'd done. And, you know, we didn't do it like the, the Church of Christ up the street from us. No, I do know for a fact they keep, they've got a pool. They've, they've got one going. They've got the filtration system. It runs 24 hours a day. And if you get saved at 2 o'clock in the morning at the preacher's house, guess where you're going? You're going up and getting in the water. You know, and I've never figured this out yet, though. If three months down the road, the person that they water baptized that was supposed to get so right with God with that water baptism, if they go back out in the world, which one failed? Their salvation or the baptism? <laughs> Both. You think about that and you think about their thinking on those things. Water baptism is important to the nation of Israel. And, you know, they fuss about how it's to be done. And I can show you verses. Well, I know the verses. Oh, no, preacher, you got to get in the water. We ain't doing no sprinkling. We ain't doing no pouring. you got to get in. And they go over there and they'll take you to Acts where Philip and the eunuch says they both went down in the water. Well, question, if they both went down in the water, who baptized who? That's really not a proof text, is it? And you've got all these things that they do, and they, they talk about these things, and they really fail to see the very reason for water baptism. Water baptism has to do with this right here, what's going on in Exodus chapter number 29, verse 4. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. Verse 7, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. In order for a priest to operate in the priest's office, he had to be washed with water. He had to be anointed with the oil, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus chapter 40. It's just another uh, text here that you can look at about the washing having to do with the priest's office. Exodus chapter 40, verse number 12. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse 14 and 15 is the same thing, dealing with the sons. So you understand that in order for Israel to be a kingdom of priests unto God, to minister to him, they have to be washed with water and they have to be anointed with the oil. Again, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. Go to Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3, because I'm not only going to cover their baptism, and I'm moving kind of quickly because I want to to get through this, because I've got to get up to the point of dealing with the Apostle Paul and you and I today. There are so many people that I talk to. We've got a couple Baptist families coming to, the, to our assembly now, and I, and I hope they continue to come. I hope they continue to grab hold to the truth of God's Word rightly divided. But I'm telling you, folks, I've been there, I've experienced it, I've watched it, I've talked to them. And when you begin to try to take water baptism away from them, it's something down inside of them that just does not want to let it go. They feel like it's so important. And can I tell you today, it is, baptism is important. You have to be baptized today. But you better understand which baptism it is that you need. Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter number 3. 
Verse number one, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse number five. Then went out to him, who? Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They use that proof text too. It was in Jordan, preacher. And, uh, you know, you, you think about these things. The whole point in this that I'm making to you out of this passage is they were baptized. They went out and they were all washed. Israel, had it had been silent. God hadn't dealt with them, hadn't spoke to them until John the Baptist came on the scene. John comes along preaching telling them to repent. When you understand the five courses of judgments that's put out on the nation of Israel, you begin to understand where they are and, and the things that's going on. They've not been the priest of God in the earth. They've not done what God gave them to do. They've not uh, kept the statutes and the judgments. They've not followed all that God said to do. And John's calling them, the nation, to repent and to be right. They were the ones that had the oracles of God given unto them. They were the ones that were to be the priest of God in the earth. They were the ones that were supposed to take uh, salvation to the ends of the earth. They were the ones that were supposed to go do that, and they had failed God, and John's calling them to get right, to, to get right with God. So you see what John's doing. Look at verse 11. And I will probably come back here just in a little bit. Uh, verse 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water, John says, unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire. There's three baptisms in that verse right there. I remember one time I preached on this subject and I thought I had to be, you know, really eloquent and tell you all the baptisms and I spent my time on all the baptisms and never got around to water baptism really in particular. But when you think about that, there's baptisms in the Bible, at least seven major categories of baptism. And when you understand, there's three right there uh, laid out for you. And when he talks about there about... Uh, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see John, he's the forerunner of Christ. He's preparing the people for the Lord. He's coming along preaching the message. He can't do the Holy Ghost thing yet. He's got the first part of it. And, and we'll get over into the book of Acts and see the second part of it here shortly. Look at John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1, look at verse 21. Uh, verse 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent uh, went, excuse me, they that were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet. Do you see in that verse, they were expecting Christ to come and baptize them? They were expecting cleansing. The verse says it. They, they question him, if, if you're not that Christ, if you're not Elias or that prophet, what, what are you doing baptizing? So you see in the verse that they were expecting baptism the Old Testament prophecies to come to pass with John here as he's out here and he's baptizing them. And that's the question. Look at chapter 3, John chapter 3. Baptism had to do with purification. It has to do with cleansing. It has to do with preparing that nation to be the priest of God as the kingdom of priests that God had uh, ordained and designed for them to be. John chapter 3 verse 22. 
After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about what? Baptism has to do with purifying. Baptism has to do with cleansing. Verse 26, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come unto him. Baptism has to do with purifying. Baptism has to do with cleansing. John comes out to a nation. He's preaching to God's chosen nation. He's preaching, telling them, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they began to, to, to listen. They began to confess their sins that they had failed God. Look at Luke chapter number 7. And they, they began to, to get right with God, some of them, and some of them didn't. And when you think about the Apostle Paul, you know, I've thought about this, and I don't know your thoughts on it, but I'm going to share with you my thoughts on it. Was the Apostle Paul around the cross? Was he some of these Pharisees standing around giving these disciples a hard time? I know this. I know from the cross till Stephen was stoned a year, about a year. And then you have the Apostle Paul becoming saved by God's grace. And if he's persecuting those Christians during just in a year, was in a year's time after and, and even earlier after the cross, no doubt he was there. No doubt he's seen John baptizing. No doubt he, was, he might have been some of, some of these standing around here in Luke chapter number 7, verse 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. They said, God's right. He's right. We want to get right. So they were getting baptized, verse 30. But the Pharisees, didn't Paul say that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee? Then he says, touching the law, blameless. Possible he could have been right here. Possibly he could have been right here. He could have been one of them that rejected that baptism. Verse number 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. They rejected that water baptism. You know, people today think you do the same thing. Oh, you're rejecting water baptism. You're like the, the Pharisees and the... No. You just understand what baptism's right and what baptism's not. But that's what's going on here. They would not take the baptism of John. They were not going to get right. You know why? You remember John chapter 10? He that climbeth up some other way is the same a thief and a robber. You know what these birds are going to do? They're trying to climb in another way, aren't they? They didn't want water baptism. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. Matter of fact, just look at John chapter 10 since we mentioned that. John chapter 10. Verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that, that entereth in by the door is the shepherd. Jesus Christ was the shepherd to the nation of Israel. Shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter, John the Baptist, openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. Christ goes in first. You remember, I believe it's in Matthew chapter number 3. John said, oh, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't want to baptize you. I have need to be baptized of you. Jesus said, well, John, fulfill, we have to fulfill all scriptures. So it goes through, and whether he goes under, whether he gets poured, or it's poured on, whether it's sprinkled upon him, when you get over there to Ezekiel chapter number 38, it's uh, 36, it's sprinkling. He's going to sprinkle clean water on them. And here, these, these leaders, these leaders are not the shepherd of the sheep. These are wolves in sheep clothing trying to lead Israel. They're trying to get in another way. But here you have the right way. Jesus enters in by the door. John opens to him. Uh, did you keep... Matthew, well, I just told you about that for sake of time. Let me move on. Um, go to Acts chapter number 2. 
I told you to remember Matthew chapter 311, where Jesus baptized with the Holy Ghost. I'm look, I just looked at this clock. My time's getting going really quick. Um, I had a fellow, I was telling somebody, I got a fellow in our assembly. He started coming for a while, but trying to understand it. From, from when I was a child, he walked in uh, to our assembly, and I went to church as a child in the Baptist church where he went. And boy, I tell you what, about 12 o'clock, he got up and walked out. I mean, he said, you got your time, and I got my time, you know. And uh, in our assembly, I preach till I get through. And I know most of you other men do too. I understand here it's a little bit different with constraints on time. I understand that. But you know that gentleman now, he stays till I get through. He's so intrigued. He's understood. He's learned so much. He, he's, he stays now till I get through. He won't get up and walk out anymore. And that's, that's a blessing to see somebody that hungry and, and st- wanting to study the Word of God. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 38. Tell you what, back up to verse 36. Then let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now you see exactly Peter He's, he's preaching the very same message John the Baptist preached. He's preaching that same message, but now since Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, he's buried, and he raises again the third day. Now Peter pr- can proclaim what John proclaimed, but now Peter can talk about the Holy Ghost coming because it's the gift that Christ gave when he went back to the right hand of the Father. And Peter, is that's what he's preaching, and that's what he's saying is going on here. So... Peter is preaching the same message John preached with the added portion of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is a part of Israel's program, folks. As they get saved here, there's, there's many added to the assembly there, to the, to the, to the uh, flock, little flock. Look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and you, you do know Matthew 28 wasn't uh, too long ago, probably about six months, six weeks ago, I had been, we'd been teaching and uh, studying some stuff in the book of Ephesians about our stand against false doctrine. Well, that, that particular Sunday evening, we had a gentleman walk in a pair of overhauls, and he had on a, a white shirt up under his overhauls and he came in with a Bible, real polite gentleman. He come sat down, he sat back over on the left hand side, two pews from the back, and, and he sat over in the corner. He listened to the whole service. Well, that particular night I'd said some things about speaking in tongues and, and we addressed a few things and talked about some things. Well he got up when I got through. He waited he was gracious enough to wait till I got through. He stood up. And he said, I you know, I don't believe you're right in talking wrong about people. And when he began to start, I just, I let him go. Because when he started, I started looking for verses just to give him for what he was talking about. And I went back and watched it. I gave him three whole minutes. In three minutes, you can say a whole lot. When he got through, I addressed the issues that he talked about with verses. Well, he didn't want to stop there. He just kept on. Then he got to quoting this passage right here. And when he started quoting Mark 16... I just said, okay, go ahead, I'll let you quote it. And he got all the way down and he said, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And I stopped him. I said, stop. And he looked at me like that. I said, you get in my car, we're going to the hospital. I need some people up here at the hospital healed. I mean, it was like I just smacked him in the face. I mean, he, he, bought, he started up and he got around and he started coming down the front aisle. Well, we got a pretty good fellow, probably a little bigger than me, sits right behind where my wife sits. He just got up and went to the back and stopped him. He said, that's far enough, fellow, right there. And he said what he had to say. And, you know, I followed that gentleman. I call him a gentleman. You call him what you want to call him. I followed him all the way out, and I caught him halfway up the sidewalk of the assembly, and I had a DVD, MP3, eight messages I'd done on basic right to vision. And I said, sir, I said, would you take this? You seem like a man that wants to know your Bible. 
would you study this with, with your Bible? He said, I don't want it. I said, are you, are you telling me, is God being the witness between me and you right now, you won't take this free thing and just study your Bible with him? He said, I don't want nothing you people's got. You know why he said that? Because there were people in the assembly when he was saying stuff, giving him verses. I was excited. I mean, to see those people react in that way and standing for truth. But you see, you just never know where they're coming from. This passage in Mark 16, look at it with me. Mark chapter 15, uh, 16, verse number 15, he says, And he, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Do you, do you believe that verse means what it says? It exactly does mean exactly what it says. He that believeth and is baptized when you preach the gospel of the kingdom, this gospel that they preach, when they believe and they get baptized, they're going to be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, do you understand that even in Matthew 28, Jesus Christ commanded those apostles to go baptize. He commanded them to do that. Well, when you get to the apostle Paul, look at Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9. See, in Ezekiel chapter number 36, if you go over there, I'm not going for sake of time because I've, I've run out a lot of time. When you go to Ezekiel 36, you read over there verses 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. You read over there about how God's going to take Israel that's been scattered during that 70th week of Daniel. He's going to bring them all back together in their land. He's going to sprinkle clean water upon them. He's going to baptize them. He's going to put a new heart in them. He's going to put his spirit. He's going to allow them to understand and be the people, the, the kingdom of priests that he wants them to be. Friend, listen, that's the deal with water baptism. That's the deal with baptism. But look at the apostle Paul. You know, you got these people that say, well, Paul was baptized and Paul baptized. Acts chapter number 9. The Apostle Paul is struck down on the road to Damascus. Here he is. He's Saul of Tarsus in this particular passage. He's, he's not Paul the Apostle yet. But he's struck down, Saul of Tarsus. He's breathing out, verse 1, threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord and one of the high priests and desired of him letters to be to Damascus and to the synagogue that if there were any found, found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem. You read down through here and, and you understand, you know when Paul's converted, you understand the story. And you understand this part. Drop down there to verse number 11. And the Lord, sa uh, Lord said unto him, Arise, talking to Ananias, go into the street which is called straight. Now watch it. See if you see anything in here where he goes tells him to water baptize Paul. Arise and go into the street which is called straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he seeth, hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias said, Lord, I have heard of by many of his, this man how much evil he hath done to, the, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and entering into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Hope that doesn't seem odd to you because the mystery had never been given to the Apostle Paul at this time. He'd never been in it, spent any time with the Lord. He just now saw the Tarsus getting saved. He's just now coming into the part of the Lord saying, huh, I'm going to show him what he's going to suffer. I'm going to show him what I got him for. He's a chosen vessel. And the only thing going on, listen, I believe that Saul of Tarsus may have been back there and seen John the Baptist. I know he was alive. I know he was on planet Earth. And I, I read where he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I know that he was among that bunch. 
The apostle Paul probably seen the water baptism, knew about the water baptism, and as Ananias does it, he goes along with it. And Paul even goes out, and he does a little baptizing himself. Now, I've not found yet, if you know a place and you can show me, I'll look at it and read it. I've not found a place yet where Ananias was ever told to baptize him. I hear a lot of people saying different things, but I've not found it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And this is my text verse, and I was going to read it to start with, and I didn't. I told you the, about being shaved by grace and <laughs> went right on. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Verse number 14, the Apostle Paul said, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crephas and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Paul says God didn't send him to baptize. We got text we understand and know in Romans eleven thirteen. Paul is the, not a, but he's the apostle to the Gentiles. In Christ, we, we looked at, Ma- at Mark and we know Matthew 28 tells that Christ commanded the disciples to go out and to baptize. And here your apostle says Christ didn't send him to baptize. Either he's blatantly rejecting Christ Matthew 28 and Mark 16, or you've got another program. And you understand, you should understand, and if you don't understand, please understand that before you leave this place this week, that there is another program. It's not the the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. It is the church, the body of Christ, that's made up of Jew, Gentile, bond, and free. It makes no difference today in the day that you and I live. And you need to understand that, and and I hope you do understand that. And if you don't, there's plenty of material around here to help you understand that. You're made up, uh, you're, you're, you're made up into the body of Christ, which is made up of Jew, Gentile, bond, and free. Look at Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number 1. I know I'm moving rather quickly, but if you've got questions, there's plenty of folks right here can answer them. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul had trouble with these Jews coming in trying to tell the, the Galatians that they needed to be uh, circumcised and keep the law of Moses and to do these things. He had trouble with them coming in doing that. And Paul says flat out, verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul goes on to say, For do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul didn't go around trying to make enemies, but Paul stood for the doctrine. And folks, sometimes you make enemies just standing for the doctrine when you don't really mean to be making enemies. You, you can stand for the doctrine and people to turn on you. But stand for the doctrine. Would you rather stand before God and be known as a good friend to everybody? Or would you rather be one that know, that's known for standing for truth and upright and trying to be a friend to everybody? There is a difference, you know. And Galatians here in verse number 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ." God Almighty, the, the, risen, the risen glorified Christ, give to the Apostle Paul the doctrine in Romans to Philemon for you and I today. We understand all the Bible. I teach all the Bible. I teach Old Testament books and, as well as New Testament books. We understand in our assembly the difference between uh, the two programs. And Romans to Philemon is your doctrine for today in, a, in, in your, your understanding on how you're to walk and live. And this is what Paul gives you. Look at Ephesians, if you will. 
chapter number 4. Because it is very important for you to be baptized today. Just not water baptized. Ephesians chapter number 4. Listen, if you're, if you're not baptized today, you're not a member of the body of Christ. I do believe in baptism. I just believe in the right one. Amen. Let me say this to you. Maybe you're watching by way of internet. You can be baptized till the tadpoles can say your social security number forwards and backwards. <laughs> it still won't get you into heaven. It's faith. It's faith in that Christ died for your sins that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. That's the gospel message today. And you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 1, uh, chapter 4, verse number 5. Look at verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter number 4 gives you that there is a baptism for us today. And baptism is important, but it's not all the baptisms. It's one baptism. And that baptism he covers for you. And look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Brother Tom covered last night the issues of this baptism in Romans chapter number 6. We're baptized, you as an unbeliever, you're baptized into his death at the cross. You're buried with him, you're resurrected with him to walk in the unison of life. Spirit baptism for the believer today, the wages of sin's what? You got to die. Christ died for you, so you have to be put into that death, and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the death of Christ right on the cross as he covered last night in Romans 6, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. And on down. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. There's your one baptism. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Back here, John the Baptist said, He that cometh after eyes, might or not, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John preached baptism of repentance. Peter preached it. And he also preached now, Christ baptized them with the Holy Ghost after they were baptized. And here, it's a different baptism. The Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ. And you become one with Him. It's a different baptism going on. That's your one baptism today. And I hope you're a believer today. If you're not a believer, you need to be saved by God's grace. You say, preacher, how, how do I get saved today? Peter said in Acts 2.38, what they needed to do, preacher, what I need to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Before I get to that, hold that. And uh, I just want to give you a passage. Years ago as a Baptist preacher, I would have said, the Holy Ghost just told me to tell you. <laughs> Turn to Colossians chapter 2, if you will. But see, I remember, I remember the passage. So I'll ask you to turn to that passage I remembered that I studied. Colossians 2.8. You see preachers do that on TV, don't you? They do it all the time. I've done it. I used to do it. I'm at, I'm at the same church. I was there. 19, I've been there. If I make it to November, I'll have 19 years in the same assembly. And the last eight has been a grace assembly. Colossians chapter number 2. Look at verse 8. Beware. You better beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the denomination of men. Really, tradition of men. But I'll tell you, those denominations, boy, they got tradition. You better watch them. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You better be watching Christ. For in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
and ye are complete in him. Praise God for that. Which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I could preach in this passage for another 30 minutes. But I hope you see the ideas there. You have a supernatural circumcision. God does the operating. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of not the pope, not the minister, not the priest, not anybody wearing a rope. Do you know you can't take your, in North Carolina, I, went, I, I used to take my taxes off my, for getting my suits clean. Two years ago, I tried that. She said, you can't do that. You got to have a robe. I said, you mean, she said, you got to have a robe take it off your taxes. I said, well, I guess that's out the window. I ain't wearing a robe. Uh, he said, verse 12, uh, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. It's God's operation. God's the one that does the baptizing. God, the Holy Spirit, places you into the body of Christ. That's your baptism, not water baptism done by some man, not being immersed by some preacher. By the way, they left me out of fellowship with God for five months. Because when I got saved, if water baptism had anything to do with it, it was five months later before they got a swimming pool where I could go get in. The last baptism I had, as far as water goes. 1 Corinthians 15, let me close with this. How do you get saved? Preacher, how do I get saved today? You have to believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If I were to ask you today, watching by the Internet, or you folks sitting here, if I were to ask you today, how do you know you're saved? What would be your response? I'm telling you, I get because I was baptized. I'm a member of the church. Folks, Paul said you need to keep in memory why. If a person doesn't say Christ died for my sins and was buried and rose again the third day, I go to question them because it's not sure to me they understand salvation at all because you ought to have in your memory, you ought to be ready to give someone an answer to how you know about your eternal life. He says that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and he rose again the third day, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures. Ephesians 1, 13. And the clock's getting ready to go off. I've got 10 seconds. But I want to read this verse to you. Ephesians 1, chapter 1. Uh-oh, I started over. Oh, well, I'm quitting. I just want to read this to you. 1 Corinthians 15, you heard the gospel message. He says in verse 13, Ephesians 1, 13, In whom the Lord Jesus Christ you also trusted... After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We just heard it. Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. In whom also after that ye believed. When you believe that message, when you trust that for your eternal salvation, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is, that's the baptism, by the way, that you get, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Thank God I've been sealed. Sealed, sealed to the day of redemption. Trust Christ today. Don't trust denominations. Don't trust works. Don't trust anything. Believe that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day for your eternal salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand and preach your word today. We pray, Lord, that as we've spoken, Lord, we know that your word and your spirit, Lord, will help us understand these things. In Jesus' name, amen.